Well, welcome to Keith Johnson's Christmas special. My name is Scott Laird. We're sitting by the fire here with a good <laughs> cup of cocoa or whatever this is in front of us here. <laughs> and with me is my good friend, Keith Johnson. Keith, thank you for doing this special. Scott, thank you for agreeing to work with me. And we called it Keith Johnson's Christmas special. I want to just tell people right off the top, in my household, in my family, in my community, I'm called the Grinch. Mm. <laughs> because okay. people say, Keith, you don't uh, celebrate Christmas, you don't promote Christmas. In fact, you do everything opposite for it. So it's kind of a weird thing when I saw <laughs> Christmas special, but it happens to be Sunday at one o'clock and at yep. ARA, we've decided that every Sunday that we can, that we've got content, we're gonna do something. And so this Sunday happens to be the time that people are, you know, whatever you want to call it yep. <laughs> during this time. And you know, you've given me a preview of this, so I yeah. watched it, yeah. and we're, we're about to let everyone else watch it. Yeah. And there's some really interesting things in there I think everybody yeah. needs to see, understand, or maybe not understand, but just sit there and ask themselves, okay, why do I do this again? Yeah. Is it really about the Messiah? Mm. If not, what is this about? Yeah. And, and there's some really deep things there, and some real surface level things too, I yes. had no idea. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I always like to give a little bit of context, and the context is that before 2002, uh, we lit up the lights, we had the Christmas tree, it was Santa Claus and all of that, and then I went to Israel in 2002, met my friend Michael Rood, and took a trip to Beit Lechem, to Bethlehem. I've got a picture here right now, I just wanna show this picture, I'm inside the Church of the Nativity, and uh, in the basement of the Church of the Nativity, there's a star, and you see people waiting in line to kiss the star and they kiss the star and come to find out historically that that particular place is built on a place of a, a, a temple, a, you know, a, a, a pagan temple. In oh. fact, Jerome even acknowledges that this is a place that is used for false worship. Oh dear. So okay. when I was there, I had something happen, Scott. After I came from there, my heart fell. I was in Bethlehem. There weren't many people there because of uh, the second intifada. And I said, Father, I know now what I have to do. There ain't gonna be no more Christmas trees at the Johnson mm -hmm. household. There ain't gonna be no more Christmas celebration. And, 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 and I think most people that are watching this understand how difficult it is to make that decision. I'll never forget it, Scott. It breaks my heart. My youngest son was about nine or 10. And I remember getting back from Israel and sitting the family down and explaining to them that you all, this is at its core, it is not pleasing to God. At its core, it's something that's opposite of who he is. And my youngest son cried because his question was, well, is, what about the presence? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, know? that's what every kid wants to yeah, know, right? He wanted to know. And so we've gone through a journey. My wife uh, has come along that journey with me. She actually has more, if I can say, I want to say this carefully so that she doesn't get too frustrated. She has more of the traditional um, the power of family, the, the Christmas, the, the feeling, all of that in her, it's not in me and it hasn't been in me even before I went, but that gave me a really good reason to say, you know, no. And so this, this special is a way for people to share with family and friends. We actually put it on Christian television. People have had great response, but I gave it to you and I wanted to get your response. What has been your Christmas uh, Oh, wow. Dance. Can I say that? <laughs> you know, it's funny as you mentioned that you never really liked Christmas. And yeah. I, I'm glad you just said that. Now, we've never talked about this before. This is the first time we're, we're talking about no. this. So mine was similar. And I think, what, and as we were saying this, I'm trying to correlate where I got this from. And I think it stems back from when I was 12 years old. And I overheard my parents fighting. And they never fought. I mean, fought oh, isn't just arguing. Right. right? Arguing about a gift that they had gotten for me that was really above their means. But mm -hmm. my dad really wanted to get it for me, and my mom was very upset about it. She ended up crying. My dad went and you know took off and went for a walk and that kind of thing. And I, mm -hmm. from then on, I hated Christmas. To me, it was it was it wow. represented just fights in the family, you know, fights about money and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I just it left a sour taste in my mouth, and I hated it. And mm -hmm. I hated kind of consumerism ever since then. Yeah. And then when I had kids back in about 2005, my daughter was about four, son was uh, six, she was six, and he was two. Mm. And that's where we started to learn about the Hebrew roots of our faith right. and just sort of right. back out of the Christmas thing. And mm. one year we took the Christmas tree down and we thought, well, we got to ease out of it slowly. So we put up a manger <laughs> <laughs> and we put the, the Christmas <laughs> gifts under the baby Jesus. <laughs> we took one of my daughter's dolls and we put it in there and I had her help me right. build a manger out of these right. pieces of a, of a, right. a pallet. Yeah. You know, that guy's, oh yeah, we kind of backed away from it too. But, yeah. and of course the kids always ask about it, but yeah. my, fortunately my son was two. So he didn't ask the questions that your son yeah. did. And my yeah. daughter, well, she didn't really care. So yeah. it's interesting. I will say this, uh, this is a, this is actually a five part series that we did, a mini series in New York. And what I learned in New York as I was doing this series called, you know, uh, now is the time. 
that I kind of tripped over this. And as a result, I realized, you know what, this would be a great thing to pull out specifically for Christmas. So at the beginning of the video, you'll hear a rewinding or a fast forwarding. That's because we're getting past all the other stuff to the short little part about Christmas okay. in the United States. And so I want people to watch it. I hope that you'll share with family and friends. I hope that people are at your house right now. You can watch it. And after that, have a discussion like, uh, like Scott and I are going to have uh, after we watch this. All right. So here you go. Keith Johnson's Christmas special. Enjoy. <laughs> I have to admit, this statue really had my imagination running wild, and for good reason. This is a statue of the Greek god Atlas holding an armillary sphere on his shoulders. The sphere had a north-south axis that points to the North Star as viewed from New York City. Laid across Atlas's shoulders is a wide curved beam that displays a frieze of the traditional symbols for Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Adjacent to Earth, over Atlas's right forearm, is a small crescent symbolizing God's clock. Affixed to one of the sphere's rings are symbols for 12 constellations through which the sun passes during the year. The zodiac strikes again. I wondered who would have enough chutzpah to place a two-ton statue of a false god holding up the heavens and the Earth directly in front of the flagship Catholic Church of New York City. There are 19 buildings in this complex with symbolic artwork that for the casual observer is just that, artwork. But for those who slow down and take a closer look, it is preaching a message that might surprise you. Some of the art is a bit abstract and leaves plenty of room for interpretation by guys like me. Can you figure out what's happening with this one? Is the clock the sun? Who knows? The art is everywhere and it made me wonder who could afford to create this massive skyscraper art gallery. John D. Rockefeller Jr., the son of arguably the richest man in modern times, that's who. Jr. was a big philanthropist with an even bigger agenda for the Protestant church and the world. New York City was his laboratory where he could test many of his international strategies on the local population. One such experiment was to create a hybrid of Protestantism. He built the tallest church in the United States to test it out right on the island of Manhattan. It was described by the New York Times in 2008 the year the Pope visited New York City, as, quote, a stronghold of activism and political debate throughout its 75-year history, influential on the nation's religious and political landscapes, unquote. Right at the entrance of the Riverside Church are miniature sculptures of a variety of ancient and modern religious leaders, philosophers, and scientists. Buddha, Confucius, and even Charles Darwin made the arch at the entrance of this place. I had to go in and see for myself what this place was all about. The sanctuary is huge and the stained glass is amazing with some very interesting images on both the wall and the floor. One of the most interesting is the labyrinth up on the platform in the floor used for meditation. This one on the window with Paul preaching about the unknown God is appropriate for this place. Rockefeller as building chairman has an entire window dedicated to his committee. Okay, so it has the stone masons on the window, but I'm not making any assumptions. I found some stairs going into the basement that led me to some more historical information about this skyscraper church. I have to admit, I was nervous about what I might find in the meditation chapel. I was relieved the door was locked. I was ready to get some air. Right next door to Riverside Church is another Rockefeller project called the Interchurch Center, nicknamed the Protestant Vatican on the Hudson by some and the God Box by others because of its square design. The Interchurch building looks like the Rockefeller building. Guess what? He gave the land, donated two million for it, and gave 500,000 for the limestone exterior. Hello? A wide variety of national denominations and social organizations set up their headquarters in this building. The Rockefeller Brothers Foundation recently relocated their offices here. Why not? Their daddy built it. Now I understood why Rockefeller chose to build his Protestant playground across the street from the Catholic Cathedral. It was good old-fashioned competition. Since the Catholics controlled the movable date of Easter from Rome, the first Sunday, after the first full moon, on or after the vernal equinox, Rockefeller needed to create a way to take control of the date for the start of the Christmas season from America. He created a marketing machine chock full with lights, cameras, action, and pagan deities to help draw a crowd. 
This place is so significant, it has even been designated as a National Historic Landmark. Impressive. With his compound, he has the Associated Press Building where reporters are depicted using different forms of communication to cover print media. And NBC Studios on the other side to cover radio and television. And in the middle of the plaza is a golden statue of a Greek god to add a little spiritual meaning to the entire Christmas festival. Do you know this god's name? Lest you think his name is unknown or unimportant, take a look at this little promo during the 2012 presidential election from what was called Democracy Square. Thank you. Jenna, Jenna, real qu a quiz, quickly. What's the name of the statue you're standing next to? What is it? Bro. Oh, that's Prometheus, of there course. I thought you were pointing to that one. Prometheus, teacher in every art, brought the fire that hath proved to mortals a means to mighty ends, unquote. I'm sure you already noticed that he's lying down on the signs of the Zodiac. Directly in front of Prometheus is Rockefeller's quote, I believe, unquote, proclamation stone, with the standard statement used by many other organizations and secret societies who want to strip God of his name so that they can create their own God who will get on their agenda. Quote, I believe in an all-wise and all-loving God, named by whatever name, unquote. Is that who is depicted on the tallest building of his complex where there is an artist rendition of this God with quote whatever name unquote you want to call him and a verse from Isaiah 33 6? The artist calls this God Urizen, who embodies law and reason and created the world with a mason's compass. It was time to take a look inside. It was clear to me that Rockefeller's hybrid Protestantism was more about the advancement of man than the worship and praise to the real creator of the universe who does have a name. Is this why he felt the confidence to set the time and place every year to light the world's tallest Asherah pole? I, I mean, Christmas tree between the pagan deities of Prometheus and Arisen? He was unashamed of what he did, where he did it, and especially when he did it. I see a visit back here on November 28th for the Now is the Time Christmas special. What do you think? Okay, it really doesn't matter what you think. Let's go. Although the official Christmas tree lighting tradition began at Rockefeller Center in 1933, the year the Rockefeller Plaza opened. The unofficial tradition began during the construction of the center when workers decorated a 20-foot tree with strings of cranberries, garlands, of paper, and even a few tin cans on Christmas Eve, 1931. Two years later, Rockefeller expanded the date of when the official tree would be lit and a whole lot more. Over the next few decades, what started as a simple Christmas tree lighting ceremony became a media extravaganza. In 1951, NBC televised its first tree lighting ceremony, and ever since then, the celebration has gotten bigger and better. Sort of. In fact, it has become so popular that there's even a corporate sponsor for the star on top of the tree, standing 10 feet tall, weighing 550 pounds and composed of 25,000 crystals with a total of 1 million facets. The Swarovski star is the largest star to ever top the tree. It is estimated that Swarovski jewelers paid as much as $1.5 million for the rights to the tree's crown. I decided to do a pre-production visit to see what I was up against, literally. This guy represents the expansion of the Rockefeller holiday season all the way from Halloween until the official taking down of the tree, which happens to be the Christian feast of the Epiphany on January 6th. He seemed more than willing to hang out with me. However, he couldn't talk. I decided to make my way over to the set of the NBC Today Show to see if I could find Matt Lauer, who seemed to be an expert on the golden god under the tree. Unfortunately, the day I visited the studios, the subs were standing in for the regulars. I took the opportunity to do a cameo with one of the alternates to see if I could get some inside information on the whereabouts of Mr. Lauer. I even tried to get an interview with Santa himself, but he must have been warned about the bald-headed brown guy with the little camera because he wanted no parts of talking to me. Santa. It seemed the closest I could get to Matt was a cutout, at least for now. I decided to catch up with him later. After my pre-production meeting, I realized this was going to be no small task. I prepared to go early on the day of the big event, but it seemed that I wasn't the only one with that idea. Because of the crowds, I considered alternative transportation, but I didn't think my new assistant would go for it. I asked my wife Andrea if she would accompany me for the big event just in case I needed some help. Surprisingly, she agreed. She tends to get a little nervous with big crowds and big events. Okay, maybe even a little scared. Heck, can you blame her? We're in New York City for one of the biggest events of the year. My mission was to get to that tree and inside the Rockefeller Center. 
Based on what I was hearing, it wasn't going to be easy. They're going to shut all of this down. It's amazing where a camera and an attractive assistant can get you. Well, they said we couldn't get close. They said we couldn't get past the borders. But the Time Will Tell project is right next to the big tree. We're here in Rockefeller Plaza. After crashing the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree lighting bash, the search began. While Andrea was looking behind the curtains, I ran into the world-famous Rockettes. You know, the young ladies that serve as cheerleaders for Rockefeller's holiday extravaganza. After attempting with no luck to get an interview from one of them, and a nudge from my wife to move on, I ran into this sign. It was as if time stopped. Have you ever had that feeling that something was worth slowing down to take a second look? Well, this was it. I felt like I was close to cracking the code to the true meaning behind this holiday extravaganza. I just needed a bit more information to break into this vault of revelation. I came to find out that Tishman Spire is not only host to this gala event, but since 2000 they have been the proud owners of the entire Rockefeller Center complex. It might be a coincidence, though I don't think so, that the front of their building sports the same zodiac that is under our golden god Prometheus. I tried to enter the building to get some answers. That didn't go so well. So before Tishman Spire moved into the Zodiac building, their home was 666 Fifth Avenue, which was sold in 2007 for $1.8 billion, which makes it the most expensive single building sale in history. I suppose I should also mention that Robert Tishman oversaw the World Trade Center building project, and at the time of his death, he was project manager of our big shiny building, which has been renamed from Freedom Tower to One World Trade Center. Okay, so Mr. Tishman was a member of Sphinx Head, a secret society at Cornell University that, quote, retained an aura of mystery throughout its history on campus, holding some closely guarded secrets and traditions, unquote. I'm just saying. After some convincing, my assistant reluctantly agreed to take a visit with me to the top of the rock at night. Once she saw the view, she calmed down, sort of. While I was caught up in the moment of seeing God's clock in the sky and our big shiny building lit up behind the Empire State Building, my assistant was insistent that it was time to go. I'm going home to watch the event on TV, yeah. which, which is what we're all wise people should be. As we made our way down the elevator, I tried to convince her it was safe and we should stay to film the Rockettes, I mean the live event. She explained that I could, quote, use my little camera to tape the event from television, unquote. Thank you for visiting Top of the Rock Observation Deck. I decided in order to keep the peace, I would just keep walking and waiting for something to catch my attention. Of course, police lights help. As I followed the flashing lights and my wife, the next thing I knew, my eyes were drawn toward the lit up red bow on this big building and then it hit me. I had seen the same building, kitty corner from the former Tishman 666 building, but didn't pay much attention to the gift that was looking me right in my face. At that moment, I realized that for the power brokers to pull off this holiday coup, there needed to be buy-in from the public, literally. What better way to create that buy-in buzz than to give a gift to the public by providing a parade that leads to a store with a sale? And who better to lead the charge than the world's largest store? Macy's has historically been the cornerstone for shopping in the Big Apple, so they were the best candidate to join in the Rockefeller rows. The founder, Roland Hussey Macy, had a five-point red star tattooed on his forearm as a teenage sailor and decided it would be the logo for what would become the star of retail in New York City and beyond. I suppose I should mention that according to historians, Roland Hussey Macy was a Mason. Where was I again? Oh, the first Macy's Parade debuted in 1924, organized by immigrant workers of Macy's and actually was called the Christmas Parade. Over the years, it got bigger and better, sort of. It helped to have none other than Rockefeller's NBC National Television Network provide the honey for the bees. I mean, to promote a parade for the people. Macy's was making its mark on the Christmas season through a powerful coalition of retailers named Federated Department Stores, which became the King Kong of retail. They were so influential, Fred Lazarus, one of the power brokers of Federated, suggested to President Roosevelt in 1939 that in the future, Thanksgiving be anchored to the fourth Thursday in November. The president supported this proposition, and within two years, it passed through Congress into law. Russell, this is going to be a grand Thanksgiving party, and we're going to have a very big turkey. I guess I should explain that the reason for the new law had nothing to do with Thanksgiving or Christmas and everything to do with the calendar and cash. The Federated Department Store power brokers wanted more time for their shopping season, 
and the Thanksgiving holiday falling on the last Thursday in November in some years was just too late for them. Maybe that's why the parade needed to change its name from the Christmas parade to Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade because it was their day based on their date to be thankful they were about to move from the red to the black. Or maybe it has to do with something even more concerning. According to the Macy's website, Macy's embraces the words and philosophy of one of its founders, Fred Lazarus Jr. Quote, Macy's Inc. succeeds by striving to be a living mirror of our civilization in which we see the constant changing needs and wishes of our people, unquote. The 2013 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade certainly reflected this philosophy. This is a fun show and it tells the story of a struggling shoe factory owner who pairs up with an outrageous cabaret performer. Here is the cast of Kinky Boots. Now, before someone charges me with overreacting to a quote unquote fun show with a bunch of men playing dress up, listen to their Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade message. Ladies, gentlemen, and those who have yet to make up their minds. Maybe the whole holiday spectacle means something more than shoppers going in the red to help retailers move into the black after all. Very early the next morning, I made a beeline via the subway back downtown. Though many folks were sleeping, I was wide awake. This time, I was back to the one man, one camera mission. I felt anticipation like a kid coming downstairs on Christmas morning looking for the wished for gift in front of the tree. I made my way back over to the set of the Today Show just to see if I could get lucky and find Matt Lauer. You know, the guy who introduced Prometheus to the world during the presidential election from Democracy Square. Just when I was about to give up my search, guess who came around the corner? Merry Christmas to me! As I was standing in front of the man who I hoped could answer my questions, I waited patiently for an opportunity to engage him. Of course, I also had one eye on the policeman who had one eye on me. I decided to join in with the production crew so as to make everyone feel a bit more comfortable. Hey, how are you? After our eyes met, Matt finally acknowledged me with a holiday greeting. Merry Christmas. I assumed this was an invitation to dialogue. Have you ever heard the saying about assuming? At that point, I realized I had to do the hard work of digging for the truth myself, even if it meant causing collateral comfort damage in the process. Well, folks, lights, camera, and action. The Christmas season has begun. But the question is this, do you know what it really means? Only time will tell. Okay, I confess. I really didn't need Matt Lauer to explain anything to me. I already knew that Rockefeller was using Christmas to promote an ancient winter party that has been celebrated for millennia amongst a plethora of pagan civilizations that was based on the worship of a star and a whole lot more. Have you ever asked yourself why so many pagan gods were born on December 25th? I have. The reason that this birth date is so popular with other religions is that the sun dies on the day of the winter solstice and is born three days later on December 25th. So to have their god be born on the birthday of the Earth star adds cosmic legitimacy to their religion. In fact, the Romans adopted the god Mithra of Persia, born on December 25th, before 1500 BC, who was depicted with the zodiac surrounding him, just like Prometheus, who sits atop the ring of the zodiac. As far as that mammoth tree, let's take a look at the prophet Jeremiah for a biblical perspective on this holiday tradition. For the customs of the peoples are vanity, for it is but a tree which one cutteth out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. As beautiful as the lights were twinkling in the early morning darkness, they are placed on the same ancient fertility symbol called an Asherah pole that was a tree set up to worship the goddess Ashtoreth. Oftentimes, the green tree was planted right next to an altar to the god who sent down his rays of light to declare time and to create offspring. Is it a coincidence that every year Rockefeller places the largest fertility god symbol in the world next to the image of his god on the tallest building in his complex just above the golden boy Prometheus? While you ponder that question, I have good news and bad news. Bad news first, depending on how you look at it. Christmas is not the reason for the Rockefeller season. The good news, Jesus, or Yeshua as he would have been called by his mother, was not born on December 25th, but more likely sometime in the fall during the seventh month based on God's calendar. 
which makes me wonder if it might be a good time to start production on another Time Will Tell series from Israel explaining the significance of the biblical seventh month. Who knows? Only time will tell. As far as Rockefeller's giant tree, everything is going exactly as he planned. I forgot to show you what happened at the Rockefeller tree lighting extravaganza in case you missed the live event like I did. After the Rockettes pranced, I mean danced in front of Prometheus, guess who came from behind the curtain to turn on the star of the show? Here to light the tree, we have the mayor of New York City, the Honorable Michael Bloomberg, the co-CEOs of Tishman Spire, Jerry Spire and Rob Spire, and the chairman of NBC Broadcasting, Ted Harbour. Five, four, three, two, one. There you have it. Once again, this time-honored tradition has officially opened the holiday season here in New York City and around the world. While you decide what to do about celebrating Rockefeller's Christmas based on his clock and calendar, I need to get back to our regularly scheduled program already in progress. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. First of all, <laughs> watching it a second time now, um, there's a lot I could say. There's some things I didn't know, yeah. and I want to bring those up in a second, but Keith, I know you want to say something first. I just want to say this. Uh, you know, first of all, the, the Pope has finally agreed. The previous Pope, other than the Pope now, he's finally came out and publicly said, you know what, guys, okay, you caught us. Because information has increased, you've done some research and realized, you know, Yeshua, Jesus for some, wasn't born on the 25th of December. <laughs> and I also want to say that, you know, I, I wasn't doing really deep research into this. I was more experiencing it mm -hmm. and asking the question, what would be the thing that would be a hook for people? So I know there's a lot of scholarship out there that's going to have different issues, but mostly what I wanted people to be able to do is to experience in the United States kind of what the root of all of yeah. this is and hopefully get them thinking and talking. Uh, for me, Scott, I am, I am adverse uh, to celebrating it. I am adverse to uh, any sort of spiritual issues around the 25th of December. I, I'm always thinking about the Ten Commandments. The first one, he says, you shall have no other gods in my presence. Mm. And I just mm -hmm. think about how Yehovah feels when we say, well, it's a God thing. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> it's a pagan thing. And sometimes we try to, you know, put him over that and somehow make it okay. Right. As they say, we'll Christianize Christ Christmas. Okay, good yeah. luck with that. So, Well, and you know, it's always say you can't redeem something that wasn't belonging to God right. in the first yeah, place. Yeah, they yeah. can't redeem Christmas. It's unredeemable. Yeah. Same yeah. thing as yeah. Halloween, right? Yeah. But Now, this was several years ago that you did yes. this. And I know that, you know, when we come into the knowledge of, of our Hebrew roots or mm -hmm. our base, or even if you don't want to call it that, mm -hmm. being Torah observant, going back mm -hmm. to the Torah and going, where does my faith come from? Right. You know, there's things that we learn afterward. We just, we don't stop learning. Mm -hmm. So since you've done this, you've learned other oh things. My goodness. So what are some things in this video that maybe you've sort of learned well, past? For, you know, for example, for example, it, it talks about the dates of the births of different yeah. you know, gods, etc. Mm -hmm. That's one where there could be some controversy, much more work about it. Um, I, I think for me, it was a great starting point for me for Christmas because I was struggling, Scott, to find a way to explain to my family and friends what it was about this particular celebration that I could not enter into and what this video did for me, family and friends, mm -hmm. they looked at it and said, even though they might continue, we got you, Keith. We understand mm -hmm. why it's not something that you would do. So for me, I'm hoping that it's helpful for people to yeah. be able to just have something else. Another thing in their, their toolbox uh, to share people. And by the way, at Root Awakenings channel, you guys have so much information and inspiration and revelation on truth and tradition. People can get a whole lot more. But since we're doing Sundays at one and I looked at the calendar and I said, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> that's Christmas day. Let me call Scott. <laughs> What's funny is I called you and say, Scott, you got a sweater? And <laughs> what'd you say? <laughs> Yep, I got a sweater. I got one sweater, Scott. I came in today and I'm looking, hey, man, ho, 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 ho. Yes, we're practically matching, yeah, practically brothers. Absolutely. Here, yeah. So anyway, I hope that people will take advantage of everything that's available. I did. Yeah, and thank you again for doing this special. Thank you. It was a great thing. And so, yes, as Keith says, there's lots of other videos you can find about uh, the, the Torah. Uh, if you are a Christian and you're looking for, okay, well, what are these guys talking about? Yeah. What do you mean, what else is there? Yeah. There's a ton out there. And yes. where do you start? You know what? I'm not going to tell you where to start. You just ask Yehovah, you ask God, say, where do you want me to start? If I'm going to go to Michael Rood, a Rood Awakenings YouTube channel, where do I start? Yes. Where do I learn? Yes. Ask him. You'll land on the right video and we invite you to learn a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to find a lot of good stuff. Now, trust me. And Keith, I think you would agree with me here that it's not going to change your faith. Jesus 
whether you call him Jesus or Yeshua, mm. he's still the Messiah, mm -hmm. okay? He's still the Messiah, that's not gonna change. What you're gonna find is that there are things in the Bible that you had questions about, and when you start to go down this road, all of those questions get answered. Right. And that's what I want you to do. So please, go to the other videos, find out more from A Rude Awakening, and again, thank you, Keith, for making the Thank you Christmas for watching, special. and thank you for picking a great sweater. <laughs>